Joe here for joining into boat parking facility or one of very nice to be here live again on um it's quite a wet day so i might have to run indoors at some point but i thought i would start off with the best intention of being out with the 16. um yeah so uh quite interesting Earlier on, I was just going through, like I said, I was going to go through all the previous questions, sessions, looking at the questions that have been coming up. And then I was going to look at making some um, actual edited videos uh, to answer those questions. And what is most interesting, I've, I've gone up to, um, I think, the sixth uh, question and answer session that we did back in June, I think it was. So I've done from the first one up till there. And there are very few questions that get repeated, which um, really does show how vast a topic sailing is um, or catamaran sailing is, uh, which is nice. And it also shows um, how thinking out of the box the Joyride TV global community are in not really repeating the same questions uh, that often. Um, live chat. Ah, okay. So I wasn't getting any chat coming in. Hello, Jeff. Below freezing there. Oh my goodness. Sorry to hear that. Hello, Jason. Nice to have you on board. Oh, what does that arrow mean? Uh, I don't know. There was an arrow, a uh, blue one. Um, question answers on a postcard for what the blue arrow was for. Um, I'm 29 degrees in Florida. Not bad, Fred. I think you're winning at the moment. It's probably, I don't know. I don't really know what it is, but probably something like 15, 16 here in, in this part of Greece at the moment. So we're still the right side of the equation, but um, there is absolutely no wind at all. So even if we weren't locked down, there wouldn't be much going on. Yeah, um, yeah. so not many questions being repeated in the previous question and answer sessions, which is very nice. Um, what else has been going on? Oh, 38 degrees. Whoa, on the Sunshine Coast. Oh my goodness, you're certainly winning. I don't think anybody's going to be beating that today. Um, I wouldn't have thought so. Well, at least in your house. Yeah. Nice. Um, yeah, so uh, there we go. If anybody's... Oh, hello, Matthew. Nice to have you on board. Um, if anybody's got any questions already, um, you could fire them at me. Otherwise, I'll just uh, see what else we can have a look at while we're here. Um, aha, Quebec, Canada. I bet it's chilly there. Oh, my goodness. All right, yeah, I'm using the microphone again, so hopefully you won't be getting any um, scrolling back noise as the scrolling back is going on. Hello, Robin, nice to have you with us from Florida. Definitely in the right region temperature-wise at the moment. It's um, quite incredible what a temperature differential you guys have within the same country from... Uh, wearing your shorts on the beach to uh, wearing all of your clothes and 17 coats uh, up north. So uh, very interesting times there. But um, yeah, so I don't know if you saw it. There was a video that got released yesterday. Um, finally, um, the refurbishing the carbon mast video went out. Um, I actually started refurbishing the carbon mast almost a year ago. So some of that footage for, was from almost a year ago. Hi, Hutchie. Are you sure you're using the remote mic? Uh -huh -huh. All right, I'm just gonna look into that. If you're getting finger noise, then that means it's... Hello, Marie. I'm in Savona, Italy. Yeah, I think I'm using the microphone, Jeff, but um, this microphone is... Uh, whether it's actually connected to the YouTube live streaming device or not, um, I don't know. I did a full test last week before 
setting off. Hi, Matt. Three degrees in South Sweden, but supposed to be eight on Sunday. Oh my goodness, of course, we'll take the boat out then. Lovely. Yeah, I'm really excited to be able to get out, back out on the water. There's quite a few videos that I want to make. And the first one that's on the list, which I'm really keen to do, is the crewing video. Um, so if um, you're just taking a non-sailor out, and they absolutely have no idea what to do, what to expect when they're going out on the boat with you. I'm going to do a crewing video, basically for these absolute non-sailors, what to expect, how to put a trapeze harness on, um, how, what to wear, how to put a trapeze harness on, where to sit on the boat, what their job is on the boat, that kind of thing. And hopefully that might take some of the... Um, apprehension out of going cat sailing for the first time for some people who have never been sailing ever before i think that will be quite a valuable video i'm just going to try turning that round how's that now jeff um oh, and are, are we getting the scrolling back noise that was the key um i did have the microphone pointing the wrong way uh which i know sounds ridiculous but um, there we are. Um, yeah, so we're, we're, we're on. Uh, so if anybody's got any questions. Yes, noisy. Yes, scrolling noise. Okay, I failed. Uh, this, this week. Um, yeah, I'm not going to try to fix it now because um, we might lose the whole thing altogether. So I'll, before ne the next one, I'll, I thought I could just switch it on and it would be fine. And the app for the microphone says it's fine, but it's clearly not. All right. Soup Classic Motoring. Hi, nice to have you on board. Is it worth... Is it worth changing the mast rake on an older, older Hobie 14 Turbo? Pain in the hole with the step and rigging needing doing. Um, it's certainly worth having your mast rake in the right spot. If when you go sailing, um, if that's what you're asking, if when you go sailing, if the boat doesn't feel particularly well balanced, if perhaps it's always heading up into the wind, or perhaps when it gets windy, if you're always sticking the nose in and um, you feel like the boat's kind of holding back, when you feel like the boat should be going faster, if all you're getting is a load of turbulence around the rudders and the boat's feeling unbalanced, then that could mean that the mast is too upright when it's windy. Um, if you're not able to get enough tension on the main sheet, if you feel that it's just far too easy to get the main sheet blocks block to block, then um, that would mean the mast is too far back and that would also probably mean that the boat is trying to head up all the time and coming away from attack would be, um, it would be more difficult to exit the tack if your mast is too far back. So there is a subtle balance and it's the kind of thing that with a boat like a 14, I would say you can get it in the right spot once and that should do you as long as you're not changing anything too drastic like uh, putting new sails on the boat or something, then once you've got it in the right spot, that would be the right spot and that should do you. So I'd say, yes, it is worth the effort of changing the mast rake if you're not happy with where it is. Okay. Question from Jason. Uh, in Australia, I was out sailing a few days ago and giving it the beans... Dot com on the trapeze sorry about the scrolling noise after nailing it last week i feel really bad that i um have not nailed it there was a bit of wave action and the rigging kept going loose over the waves does this suggest rig tension isn't tight enough yeah i would say yes for sure um definitely worth having a tighter rig if that is the situation. But 
if having a tighter rig is bringing the, the mast too upright, then what you want to do is move the adjusters down one on the uh, adjusters here, move the adjusters on the adjusters down one here. Oh, oh yeah. Um, down one here. So then you can sail with the rig tighter and the mast will still be in a similar position. It won't be going further forwards from having more, uh, what do you call it, jib halyard on. So yeah, move the crowds down and then crank the rig tension on tighter and that will serve you well to stop the mast slopping around. Because also, if your mast is moving around, as well as it not being very nice and it doesn't sound very good and uh, it's just quite a horrible feeling, there could be things that are working themselves loose every time the mast moves around, like the shackles up the mast, uh, the pins, all sorts of things, and all that kind of, what you call it, like snatching, when the mast goes bing, and that, uh, what they call that, like a, a snapping force, you're more likely to break something if the mast's moving around a lot. So for that reason, yes, tighten the rig. Um, Robin says, it's even pretty chilly for Florida today. Wow, seven degrees. Oh my goodness, that is chilly. Yes. Um, oh, winter is certainly upon us up here in the north. Um, Jason says, I also found I kept losing the main sheet in the water behind the boat. Any tips on not losing the main sheet behind the boat in those sort of conditions? All that I could recommend is just constant supervision. Um, it is a bit of a, um, a drag to have to do it, but just, you're, all right, here we are. You're steering the boat, stick in one hand, main sheet in the other hand, and in your third hand, which you don't have, of course. So your focus should be steering the boat, where are you going, what are the sails doing, what else is going on on the water, and what is going on on your boat. So if at any point you see that there's a chance that your main sheet or anything else is going to disappear off the back of the boat or anywhere else or through the trampoline, anything like that, then do something about it before it happens. Because once you even get, I'm sure everybody's found this, once you even get the smallest amount of rope in the water, whatever it is, then the friction from the water pulling on the rope will just pull the rest of it in the water. And then before you know it, you've got quite a job on your hands to get that all sorted out. Uh, so get things sorted out before they happen. And that way things won't happen. When I'm uh, on the boat, uh, I am constantly looking around the boat for things that are going to cause issues. Uh, because it's the nature of, uh, of boat sailing is there are, there are a lot of things on the boat and everything is getting shaken into the wrong position or everything is trying to cause you problems. So always be looking around the boat for things that are going to cause you problems in the future. And that way you can do something about it before it happens. I think if you... Next time you go out sailing, um, ev this is for everybody, of course, um, just really scan the boat all of the time, looking for things that are going to cause you difficulties. And that way you should have less things that are going on. A scan of the boat should only take two seconds or something and you can see pretty much everything. And if you get into the habit of doing that, you'll soon learn where are the areas of the boat which don't really need that much of a look? And where are the areas of the boat which do need a bit more of a look? There we are. Thank you, Jason. Okay, Matt, with the FX1. have started sailing my FX1 without wings. Oh, yeah. That's uh, called classic, I believe. Classic FX1 style. Um, Thinking of putting a pair of foot straps behind the rear beam. What do you think is a good placement all the way in the back, in the middle or close to the beam? Ooh, 
spicy question. Um, what you could do, and what I've seen done, is uh, to actually put uh, one foot strap on each side, actually, um, if this was an FX1, of course. So the foot strap is actually um, bolted in to the end of the beam. So you've got one foot strap on the end of the beam. Uh, and that means that you don't need to put um, the holes in the boat to screw the foot strap into. But it really depends on where you're finding that your, your position is on the boat most frequently. If it was me, my most frequent position, if I am trapezing behind the back beam, well, with one foot behind the back beam on the boat, my back foot is all the way under the rudder stock as far back as it would go. So my position, because of the conditions that I'm sailing in and how I'm treating the boat, my position would be right to the back. But perhaps that position might put you a bit too far back for where you usually find yourself. So I think it's definitely worth experimenting a bit with different positions on the boat and finding where is that comfortable spot that you really like to be and that would be a good place to put the foot strap um do make sure if you are fitting a foot strap to the boat um that on the inside of the hull you're putting a very very large washer or better still some sort of plate um where so that plate is going to have the nuts pulling against it so you're not gonna uh have those nuts holding the foot strap in rip out if um the two most common causes of foot straps ripping out would be the first one if you were to do a really spicy pitch pole with your foot absolutely wedged into the foot strap it's definitely better you rip the foot strap out rather than uh you stay locked in there as you go whirling through the air but the other most common reason for a foot strap pulling out is because somebody's trying to help you and they're using the foot strap as a handle. And even if you've got a big plate on the inside, you should always discourage people from using your foot straps as a handle because uh, you don't want that much pressure on that bit of the boat. Because on the FX1 especially, the uh, fiberglass on the top is pretty thin. So uh, you do need some reinforcement there reinforcement coming from a plate on the inside yeah so um it's definitely a question of taste but um i'd go all the way back um but you could go all the way back and then perhaps put one on the end of the beam as well so then you've got two no worries mats um i hope that helps at least slightly okay jason i did have the idea of holding the this is Jason with the rope off the boat. Uh, very common problem. Holding the slack below my hand with the toe of my forward foot. Engaging the toe. Yeah, it's a good idea. Um, there are all sorts of things that you can do. Um, if I'm on, uh, so I'm, am I guessing that you're on the trapeze there or... Uh, Oh, maybe you sat on the trampoline. Yeah, if you sat on the trampoline, you can certainly do a lot with your feet. Um, if you've got one foot under the toe strap, your other foot can be um, working just to do a bit of sweeping of the trampoline. If everything's moving towards the back constantly, your spare foot could be just sweeping the trampoline forwards or um, acting as a blocker to stop anything coming too far to the back of the boat. If it is happening constantly, one thing you could do, I haven't actually done this myself. Let's, uh, let's go over here. Um, so I just took half the cover off, just in case it did start raining. <laughs> but what you could do, oh yes, trapezing, all right, yeah. Um, is you could put um, a piece of elastic with quite a lot of stretch. So 
if you had a piece of elastic that finished about middle of the trampoline, maybe with a stainless steel ring, this is a stainless steel ring, um, stainless steel ring, middle of the trampoline on elastic, going all the way forwards, maybe through the tramp lacing at the front, round the dolphin striker, all the way to the back, through something at the back, and then forwards again, so that elastic has got loads and loads of stretch. And then if you take your main sheet, uh, main sheet traveller line, pass it through that stainless steel ring, that's going to hold the line a bit further forwards on the trampoline, so there is a bit less chance of it going off the back of the boat. I have seen other people doing this um, on their boats and um, they seem to like it. I'm a big fan of having the fewest things on the boat as possible. If there's something on the boat that isn't necessary, I'd rather take it off because more things on the boat means more potential for ropes getting caught. Um, it's the nature of ropes. They'll get caught on stuff if there's stuff there to get caught on. So taking things off the boat is my preference, but that, if you're out in waves a lot and you're losing the rope off the boat, then that could be a good method. Another thing to bear in mind is, um, is your main sheet too long? If the main sheet's too long, then it's gonna be way too easy for a bit of it to fall in the water then before you know it, the water's got hold of it and it's pulled it out. But um, what I like to do, um, here we go, I'm going to try to simulate trapezing here. Boat is on the trailer, so it's very high up. Um, I don't even know, I don't really know what I'm going to do here, but um, I'll try. All right, so there is the, um, what do you call that, the sidebar of the boat. Here we go, <laughs> stand up here. All right, take one for the team here. So I'll be trapezing. All right, let's um, move the leg in. So now the sidebar is there. And what I would do is always have the main sheet going around the leg here. So the main sheet is actually ending up underneath you. So that loop of main sheet is gonna be under here. And that is gonna take quite a lot of the slack. I think that wasn't the best explanation, but maybe you get what I was saying. Um, so that slack is there. And then what I do is um, actually in the top of the, kind of like that bit of the trapeze harness, when I've got a minute, I'll just put the main sheet, just run it in there and that will hold it. Um, that will just hold it away from the water. Okay, there we go. If any of that helps, then... Uh, I'm glad, but, um... oh, hello, Alessandro, nice to have you on board. How can I avoid my new to sailing crew <laughs> to fly off the back of the boat while trapezing? What a great question that is. Nobody wants what is commonly known as, if you're double trapezing, we would call that the wrecking ball. Um, where you've got the guy at the front is just, hold on, how can we do this with the hands? The, all right, we're doing it this way around. This is the guy at the front. The guy at the front constantly falling back and your job as the um, helmsman, as well as trapezing, steering the boat, uh, making sure the sails are in the right position, your job is also to stop him from flying back. So the um, most straightforward and simple thing you can engage uh, when trapezing or when instructing someone who's new to trapezing is if they're feeling like they're getting pulled in a direction, whether it be forwards or backwards on the boat, then if they have the leg in the direction of where they're getting pulled straight and the other leg slightly bent, then that means they're going to be bracing against that direction of pull. Um, yeah, of course, the further they have their feet apart, that's going to make them more stable as well. 
because if you've got a beginner crew and they're tra trying to trapeze like an old pro with their feet right together, perhaps with this slightly forward facing uh, racy stance, then they're going to be tremendously unstable. Whereas if they've got this, uh, what has been called in the past, a bell ringer on the toilet stance, uh, where you've got your, your um, feet as wide apart as they'll go, hanging on to the trapeze handle, both hands, that's the bell ringer part, um, then um, they'll be much more stable. But having that leg braced, so a straight leg to stop them from swinging backwards, that is really going to help. Also, making sure that they're holding on to the jib sheet um, is a good idea. Um, so then they can use the jib sheet for a bit of support against going back. And another thing you could do is give them the traveller line off the main sheet. So then they've got this triangle between their arms, stopping them from going backwards or forwards. And that if they get that position, they should be feeling quite secure. And everybody is happy with that level of security. So there you go. Um, yeah, but uh, yeah, I did mention at the start my next video I'm going to make on the next time that I go out on the water, although this is going to be quite tricky thinking about it if I'm going out alone. But um, a video that uh, maybe I'll even make it on land for next week is what instructions does a brand new crew need who's never been sailing before? I think this will be a very useful video that could be used by a lot of people um, so that if you're sailing with new people all the time, you don't always need to be uh, giving them the same instructions. In fact, maybe I'll do a, a prior video saying what instructions do you give a brand new crew? And I'll make sure we get all of those instructions in this video. And then um, that means that when you've got your new crew, you send them the link, watch this, it will tell you what to do. And then they'll watch it. And then when they come out on the boat with you, um, it'll be like you've got somebody who kind of knows what to expect, at least, on the boat with you. Thanks for the question, Alessandro. Nice. No, sorry about the scrolling noise today. I don't seem to have managed quite as well with the microphone uh, this week as I did last week. All right. Lucas, hello. Nice to have you on board. What would be your piece of advice for somebody who is switching from dinghy to catamaran sailing? Um, yeah, it's a good question. I would say um, start off, don't get too excited. I know for some people you have a limited period of time when you can get out on the water, perhaps at your club. There might not be um, safety cover all of the time, only at weekends maybe, or... Um, you might be limited by the tide or by time off work, that kind of thing. But I would strongly recommend if you're just starting catamaran sailing with you as the skipper, um, then don't go out in too much wind too soon. Because if you go out in too much wind too soon, you are likely to get the fear. Because uh, from speaking to monohull sailors, who are going catamaran sailing for the first times quite a lot out here at Wildwind. Um, one of the things that they find most intimidating is that the catamaran just seems to be a bit like a runaway train, which is very difficult to get it to slow down or stop. Because with a lot, with most traditional monohulls, like with a laser or something similar, which doesn't have a fully battened mainsail, when you let the mainsail out, the boat stops. That's it, done. With something with a fully battened mainsail or with a catamaran, you let the mainsail out and it would, although the hull might come down, the boat's not gonna slow down massively if you're like on a beam reach and you let the mainsail out, the boat is gonna keep going. So if you go out with slightly lighter wind, just for the first couple of goes, and if it was possible to build yourself up to in wind strength rather than trying to 
get it all at once, that is going to be very valuable. I think also very valuable would be to go out um, with an experienced catamaran sailor as the crew, maybe just once, just so you've got an idea of um, how it should feel um, and what the boat's capable of, and maybe just to give forget for them to give you a few pointers, perhaps on uh, some of the most uh, challenging things with a new boat, any type of new boat, is the launching and recovery at the venue where you're sailing. Because the actual sailing of the boat, you can get most of that from Joyrider TV. I know, I've looked. Um, but the launching and recovery is very specific to your venue, your location. So definitely worth talking to us, some people, watching what other people are doing with their boats when they're going out, seeing um, what seems to work, what doesn't seem to work. Don't be in too much of a rush um, to just like, all right, get the sails up, push the boat in. Oh no, what are we do? Where are we gonna put the trolley? All this kind of thing. So um, just take your time, look at what other people are doing, get some experience from, um, let's call them the old guys, um, and that should help to take some of the sting out of it for the first time. But if you've done loads and loads of monohull sailing, as long as it's not above, let's say, 15 knots of wind, um, then you should probably be all right. Don't take my word for it, um, but you'd probably be all right. But the fundamental differences are how you trim the mainsail, what you do with the traveller, um, how to avoid sticking the nose in, how to tack, how to stop, how to jibe. And I think that's probably the main bits. Maybe I'll, I'll give this some thought later on and write a list of what are the most important things which are different when sailing a catamaran. Good idea for a video, thank you. Um, all right. All right, just having a look here. All right, Matt's with the FX1 is thinking of an endless jib sheet. Nice, it's a nice idea. Um, if you're not using a, uh, a self-tacking jib on your FX1, then I would guess that the system that you've got on the boat would be similar to that on a Hobie 16. where the jib sheet is coming from the cleat on one side, going across the boat, going across to the other side. I would, if you haven't got a self-tacking jib, I would say that would be, um, oh, you do have self-tacking. Uh -huh. Well, in that case, yes, exactly what you're saying. So the jib sheet would come from here and um, from there, then you really want it going into the front beam. Okay, of course, this is the Hobie 16, and, but we're getting just the um, general directions of where to go. So you want that going to the front beam. The other way you could route it would be to get it to go back to the shroud and then through a small pulley or a stainless, one of these stainless rings, big fan of the stainless ring, um, through the ring and then forwards. Hold on. And then forwards like this and then into the front beam. And that means it'll be a lot easier for you to get hold of, especially if you're a bit further back, uh, single-handed on the boat. I have actually, um, I have actually made a video on how to put your lines inside the front beam on your boat. Um, so if you can't find that, uh, once this video is uploaded, which would usually be um, a couple of hours after it's finished, uh, just put it in the comments. Uh, could you give me the link to that video? And then I'll give you the link to that video. But it's almost certainly, pardon, um, it's almost certainly in the index of videos and there you'll be 
uh, yeah, it's very nice to keep all your ropes tidy, put them inside the front beam, and it's a good project. Um, oh yeah, if you're in Sweden, then um, I'd say that there will be those long winter nights, evenings, afternoons, um, when, uh, especially if you've got a nice uh, luxurious heated shed where you can put your boat, then uh, what a lovely time you could have. Get the tunes on, uh, get your tools out, bits of rope, elastic, all sorts, and uh, prime time boat tinkering conditions there. Nice. All right, scrolling back. All right, sorry about the noise. Um, okay. Falcoon 77, nice to have you on board. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, the perfect start. The perfect start on the line of regatta for a Hobie Tiger. Ooh, lovely. Yeah, there's, um, yeah, the start line is an interesting place. Um, where do we begin? Yeah, so, um, with the uh, when I'm racing in a an international regatta, um, what I'm my most primary concern is to reduce the chance of making mistakes. I'll do this in a separate video, and we could even use a bit of um, virtual regatta to um, illustrate some of the points because virtual regatta is very good for all of, in fact, I would strongly recommend to everybody, if you can't go sailing, because either it's too cold, um, you've already put your boat away, uh, the lake's frozen over, or maybe there's no wind, have a go on Virtual Regatta. It's just a website. Um, you just go to virtualregatta.com, um, do the inshore series. It's completely free of charge. Um, and... Um, have a go on virtual regatta. You learn so much about racing on virtual regatta. It's very realistic. And um, the thing is, each race lasts about six minutes. So if you don't do so well in a race, try to analyse where it went wrong and then do the next one and uh, take it from there. Um, I did some tutorial videos on virtual regatta. Sort of, uh, when would that have been? February, I should think. Um, again, I can put some links to those uh, later on. But, um, yeah. But Virtual Regatta, brilliant for learning starting line strategy. But my strategy is always to go for space. Because um, getting involved on the start line in a fight, unless you're pretty sure you're going to win that fight, but the, if there are a lot of boats in the same vicinity as where you are, the chance of you getting away cleanly is much reduced. Whereas if you've got loads of space, then you could get off the start line with speed, um, going the right way without having to try and nudge over the top of somebody um, much better that way. So I always go for space on the start line. At the start of an event, um, it's always tricky to know where that space is going to be. So on the first start of an event, it's worth hanging back a little bit and then going into the start line, perhaps with about, let's say it's, if let's say you've got a fleet of 30 boats. Um, so with about a minute and a half to go before the start, then come up behind the other boats, look for where the biggest amount of spaces and then put your boat there at the windward end of that space, which means then when the starting gun goes, you can bear away a bit, really get some speed on, get away from the boats which are on top of you. And there you go. Um, so focusing more, definitely in the earlier stages, focusing more on getting away cleanly rather than uh, looking at the line bias and thinking, right, we need to be starting at that end because that's going to give us an advantage. Because if, 
let's say the line is biased to starting at the pin end, the opposite end to the committee boat, then um, it means that everybody is likely to be there, which means it's going to be crowded. And then we've got this problem again of not being able to get away cleanly. So well worth just going for the space um, on the start line. But definitely worth a video there. Thanks for the idea. And oh my goodness, it's starting to rain. All right. I might just go through the questions we've got already and then call this today. It's been, I'd like, I think this has been quite a slow one. Uh, and we're up to 40 minutes already. So I think we're doing well. Um, all right, Falcoon. Plus, can you make a video of the assembly of the Tiger STX? Because there are some modifications that aren't written anywhere. Um, yeah, so um, I did make some... I'll have to check what Tiger building videos I've made, but um, I think I'll have a look into that later on and um, put a link to all of the videos I've made relevant to Tiger building um, because it will all be very relevant. Um, if there's not, maybe I, I will make a complete Tiger building video in... Uh, April when I come to be putting all the boats together just so we've got a complete uh, start to finish like I did this year for the 16 for the FX1 and for the Tornado uh, I think that would be quite valuable all right aha uh -huh. Falcoon is Alexander just answered a mail about the Hobie Tiger STX just bought it nice all right, Jason says, yes, I, uh, S, I can't think what those letters would be myself. The first time I went out 13 knots, found four, five, six knots is manageable. Definitely got the fear. Yeah, the fear is very difficult to recover from. So don't mess around with the fear. You don't want the fear uh, because it takes a while to recover from that bad boy. All right, I'm just going to see if I can take shelter least a little bit. Oh, I've got some strange reverb effects going on. All right. Um, all right, scrolling back. Yeah, so really um, be very careful when going cat sailing for the first time or for the first couple of times not to try to do too much too soon because once you've got the fear, getting back on the boat after that is going to seem like quite a mountain to climb. So just really do take it easy to start with. Sorry about shaky camera. I'm just doing something about it here. Um, Jeff says it took him 25 years. Yeah, um, that's a long time, Jeff. But at least you got there in the end. Um, Scrolling back. All right, I've got John Bishop on here. I believe that is John Bishop, who is the, um, what would you call him? The um, orchestrator of some very, very high quality learn to skateboard videos. Um, but um, well worth taking a look at John's channel. If you're in any way interested in skateboarding, then John has put himself through a lot of punishment, learning how to be a very competent uh, skateboarder in uh, pools and I think branching into vert ramps as well. But John says, uh, John also used to be... Um, uh, an instructor on the Wild Wind Beach and a very good sailor indeed. Port Flyer says, John, bang the left corner works every time like a coconut. That's exactly how he speaks as well. Um, yeah, Port Flyer, definitely if it's your first race, then just, no, um, let's not take that as good advice at this time. 
All right, Graham Shaw, he likes potatoes. We heard that about you, Graham, and um, it's good to know that you're still staying strong and true. Lucas says, would you recommend only going, would you then recommend, okay, uh, to only use your mainsail first time going out to people? No, I would still say take the jib because if you say, if you um, new to catamaran sailing, the jib is really going to help you with your tacking and it's going to help to prevent stalling. So take the jib with you. It's going to make everything much easier. Um, but just go out with less wind. John Bishop, sailing a laser, 1 to 25 knots at Felix Doe Ferry Sailing Club when he was 15 years old, mast high waves. That provided the fear. I was actually sailing in the very same event um, from Felix Doe Ferry Sailing Club, of course. I believe that John came first, I came third. And um, I think that was it for my laser sailing career. And then... Um, very much focused on catamarans from then onwards. Right, I'm going to wrap this up in a jiffy Phil says house. However, yeah, it's raining. It's not particularly chirpy just now. Uh, not a very nice day, but good for ducks. And most importantly out here, it's good for the grapes and good for the olives. Um, at the moment um, here in Vasiliki, it's very much olive harvesting time when all of the local people most days are in the olive groves harvesting olives. It looks downright miserable as a thing to do, but they have to do it. And then all of these olives, they take them away in bags to an olive oil factory or an olive oil processing facility where people get their weight in olives given back to them in olive oil process. So it's like a big uh, thing. Just thought you might like to know about olive oil there. Um, Soup Classic Motoring says, uh, building a four-wheel dolly that will also act as a cradle for hoisting the cat onto the beach. Nice. Any tips? I would, my biggest tip would be, um, depending on what sort of surface it is that is your beach, um, I know they are very expensive, but getting hold of, have I got one here? No, I haven't got one here. But um, the really big wheels, um, the massive trolley wheels, this is um, hard sand. Okay, yeah, so the small, like, dinghy trolley size wheels, if you've, especially if you've got four on there, that'll work well. But if you can stretch to it, the big wheels are really, really good. Um, and we get ours from um, a company called CAD Cat, which is in Germany, and they cost about 150 euros per wheel. Pardon, pardon. And then you've got to buy the bearings as well. But then if you could get the cradles, it does work out quite expensive, to be honest. But um, the actual, the main axle of the trolley, you can source yourself it only needs to be a tube but then you do have to buy the um the wheels the crawlers should i keep the holes as low as possible as in below or near the axle center yeah yeah um yeah so the cradles want to be fed they don't want to be tall the cradles want to be low down so yes what you're saying um the boat does want to be as close to the axle as possible because if you have it high up, it's going to be less stable. And for those times when you've got your boat sat on the beach, sat on the trolley sails up with a bit of wind, you want that as low down as possible, really. Um, yeah, yeah, it's a good, good plan. Get the boat down low. You want as wide a wheelbase as possible. So put the wheels as close to the hulls as they'll go, but without risking touching the hulls because then the boat's going to be more uh, stable. But if you want, um, again, put it in the comments later on, not in these live comments, but the later comments, um, once the video's uploaded, if you do want a link to uh, just find out about these wheels in Germany. I don't know which country you're in, 
Um, so whether Europe is a good place for you. But this company, CADCAT, they do ship all over Europe and I dare say all over the world. So worth a look there. On that note, I'm going to wrap this up because it is raining and um, from years of working in Greece, one thing that we don't agree with is doing things in the rain. So uh, there we go. Thanks to everybody for tuning in. It's been a great pleasure. I'll be back next Wednesday with some more. Do come armed with your most um, uh, with your with your most questions that you can, and I'll do my best to answer them. But in the meantime, um, do dive into the archives, have a poke around because there's a lot there. Um, I think we're getting close to. There's probably something like 600 videos, but maybe. 450 of them are really relevant to what we're talking about here. So do have a look. And before you go, if you could just um, give this a like, that would be very nice. Um, that would just help for other people to see this later on. Oh, Sean, peace, bro. And I'll catch you all later on. Thank you very much indeed.